<clears throat> Hello everyone and welcome back to microbiology. This is chapter 13, microbial growth. Microbes can be found on just about any non-living object and any non-living object that is contaminated with microbes is called a fomite. This image here shows a uh, series of platings that was done by swabbing different areas of a car and then counting the number of CFUs that are present. And as we can see, there's a lot of microbes that uh, exist um, in areas, especially those that are handled frequently. So you can imagine that these are human uh, transferred microbes in this situation, mostly. And so in microbiology, in order to study microbes, we need a way of removing them first from surfaces. And uh, the process that's probably uh, most efficient for doing this is sterilization using autoclaves. So sterilization is literally the removal of all microbes. And so you'll see steril autoclaves being used in our lab and labs across the country and medical facilities um, in order to sterilize tubes and plates and media and any sort of lab where you can imagine almost. There are a few definitions that we need to be aware of. You probably have heard of these used before, but maybe you didn't know the exact definition for them. So um, asepsis means to be free of disease causing infections. Um, and so aseptic technique is a collection of methods that are used in order to prevent microbial contamination. So an example of this would be using sterile equipment and sterilizing or disposing of contaminated equipment properly. There's something called commercial sterilization, and this isn't to be confused with uh, sterilization itself. Commercial sterilization is something that's less vigorous. It's used to reduce disease causing and food spoilage microbes to safe and acceptable ranges. So it doesn't achieve true sterilization. However, microbes like Clostridium botulinum, which produce endospores, um, are destroyed in this process, thereby preventing people from getting botul botulism poisoning or an infection. And uh, usually botulism is associated with improper home canning, jar jarring, or brewing. Um, another reason why commercial sterilization is done is in order to keep food quality intact. So through commercial sterilization, you're reducing the uh, food spoilage due to microbes. Now, disinfection and sanitation are another two terms that we need to be aware of. So both of these reduce the numbers of microbes on fomites. However, neither of these destroy endospores, so they do not accomplish sterilization. Disinfection is a little bit more rigorous than sanitization. It requires long exposure of fomites to chemicals. Sanitization requires shorter exposure, but still meets certain public health standards for cleanliness. Next is de-germing, and de-germing is just the removal of microbes through scrubbing, washing, ordinary soap, bathing. All of these are examples of de-germing. Two definitions or terms that we often see being associated with these processes is cidal versus static. So cidal means to kill, like homicidal, suicidal, right? There's death involved. So blank cidal chemicals involve killing microbes. An example of this would be a fungicidal chemical would kill fungi. Static inhibition, static means to inhibit microbial growth. So a bacterial static chemical would slow bacterial growth. So you often find food preservatives that are static. So remember we talked about autoclaves. Autoclaves have the ability of using moist heat in the form of high pressure steam in order to sterilize. 
And moist heat is just a little bit better at sterilizing than dry heat. And in this picture here, um, you don't have to memorize all of the um, components to this machine, but you need to be able to be aware that it can safely apply pressure uh, and, and water that becomes uh, superheated and uh, um, a, a safety valve on it so that it doesn't get overpressurized. You do need to know though that the uh, common exposure time is 20 minutes at 121 degrees Celsius. And this is for objects with relatively low thermal mass. So because autoclaves um, have a complex form of pipes, tubing, uh, gaskets, pressure relief valves, etc., um, they are prone to error and breaking down. So one of the key components to this process is using uh, an indicator that uh, tells the user if their uh, labware reached um, the proper temperature. And that indicator is autoclave tape. As you can see in this image to the right, autoclave tape um, goes from a clear or yellow color to a black color when it's been heated up to the correct temperature. Uh, you should be aware though that this does not calculate the exposure time, just if it's ever been exposed to that high temperature or not. And um, while we're discussing times, it's also important to be aware that, like we said, um, 20 minutes is for something that has a low thermal mass. Um, you can imagine if you wanted to heat up a pot without any water in it on the stove, it would heat up very quickly. But if you had water in it and you were trying to heat it to, let's say, 100 degrees Celsius, it could take a lot longer for that water to heat up and boil. So when you make solutions, oftentimes you need to exceed that 20 minute rule of thumb. And the reason why we use this high pressure system is because boiling in and of itself does not destroy endospores. Uh, remember the endospores are kind of these bomb shelters that bacteria make that make them highly resistant to um, environmental extremes. So um, you might recall uh, Louis Pasteur did a boiling experiment with these swan neck flasks and luckily he didn't have any uh, bad exposure to endospor endospores or else we might still be struggling with uh, disproving abiogenesis. Um, so this is why it's recommended that you use a pressure cooker if you're ever doing home jarring in order to prevent uh, their survival of endospores. Um, Clostridium botulinum is an example of a bacterium that does form endospores, so we need to be aware of that. Louis Pasteur developed a process called pasteurization, which does not sterilize, um, but however, it does use a high heat at brief exposures in order to kill pathogenic and spoilage microbes. So it's used for you know milk and dairy products, juice products, sometimes eggs and honey products as well. Um, and uh, raw milk, juice, honey that has not been treated should not be given to young people or people who are immunocompromised because it could have some bacteria that could be harmful to that, to that individual. There are uh, a couple main types of pasteurizations that are used to sterilize milk. Um, the first one and the most common one here in the United States is high temperature, short time pasteurization, abbreviated HTST. The milk is heated at 72 degrees Celsius or about 160 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 seconds, and then it's bottled and refrigerated. Ultra high temperature pasteurization or UHT pasteurization heats the milk up to 138 degrees Celsius for two or more seconds. Then it's sealed in an airtight container for up to 90 days without 
refrigeration. And what this allows one to do is to, you know, provide pasteurization without necessarily uh, neg negatively affecting taste or flavor of different food products. Another method for uh, slowing microbial growth is freezing. And freezing can preserve food, but it does not reliably kill pathogens. It just slows their growth. So um, some pathogens, a lot of microbes do survive the process of freezing. It's just that when foods are frozen, they're metabolically less active. And so their ability to degrade um, or spoil food is going to be greatly inhibited. Refrigeration is another method we use to slow microbial growth, but again, it, uh, it doesn't kill the microbes itself um, and it doesn't slow their growth as much as freezing does. So um, there is one important exception to this and that's Listeria monocytogenes and um, it's actually psychrophilic bacterium, so it does grow well at cold temperatures. And I'm sure most of you have heard of listeriosis, which is caused from consuming this bacterium. Um, susceptible foods to this bacterium include dairy products and lunch meats. Uh, preservatives can help to control its growth but heating foods until they steam or avoiding susceptible foods is the safest way in dealing with them. Desiccation or drying is another way to preserve food. Uh, it's quite an old method. Um, it does not sterilize, however, but it does slow microbial growth. And here is our first checkpoint, checkpoint one. You have put together some clean test tubes. They are in the rack with loose caps on them and autoclave tape. What temperature would you autoclave them for sterilization? So this is a multiple choice question. You can just answer with the, the letter. Checkpoint two. Milk from a local dairy farm is pasteurized at 72 degrees Celsius. This is a form of blank. Okay, the next method is lyophilization. And in this situation, uh, an object is placed under a strong vacuum. And what occurs is this vacuum pulls on water or ice um, after it's been pre-frozen. And that causes the, the object to um, have all of the water evaporate and le leads to sublimation, which is the process of a solid changing to a gas before melting to a liquid. So um, this process keeps the sample very cold during the drying process. And a lot of the other drying processes, we're actually dealing with uh, dry or elevated temps or even just room temperature to help encourage evaporation before food spoilage occurs. So as this drying process is occurring out of the vacuum, that object is actually cooling down more and more and more. Um, and so it's a, it's a great way to cool a sample quickly and dry it out quickly. So this tends to be a much better form of preservation than just uh, desiccation. And the reason why these work so well is uh, something called uh, water activity. So the water content of foods and materials is called water activity and it can be lowered without physical drying by the addition of solutes. Um, solutes are commonly used in foods are salts and sugars. Uh, for example, um, honey is uh, well preserved on its own and that's one of the reasons why is because it has 80% sucrose. So 80% um, of the content of honey 
um, by mass per volume is sugar. Uh, molds and yeasts tend to be a lot more tolerant to low water activity environments, and that's why you often see them, you know, growing on things that should be otherwise preserved or shouldn't have bacteria growing on them. Like maybe bread, for example, you'll have molds growing on the top of them. So high sugar or salt content will also pre uh, preserve foods by dehydrating microbes in the foods. And these foods include uh, fruits, dried seaweed, um, jams, jellies, uh, salted meats, those sorts of things. Another method for killing microbes is ionizing radiation. These include gamma rays, some wavelengths of X-rays, beams of electrons. All of these are ionizing and damage DNA, RNA, and proteins. And these can result in fatal mutations or cell death. Um, fortunately though, after the sample has been exposed to these electromagnetic waves, um, those electromagnetic waves disappear and then there are no longer any you know, residue waves hanging around, just like if you shine a you know a light on a surface and then you turn off the 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 light the light is gone it's no longer you know affecting that surface and that surface is no longer you know giving off any more light unless it's a fluorescent molecule but that's not the same light that's it's emitting its own light at that point it's just harvested some of the energy from that light that you expose it to and this is really important for treating lab plastics, medical supplies, and some foods. And this image right here, uh, don't be too overwhelmed by this. You don't have to memorize that equation on the bottom, but this is the electromagnetic spectrum. So you can see right in the middle is the spectrum we're most intimately aware of, and that's visible light. And as we discussed, we have you know, X-rays and gamma rays to the left there. And underneath where it says X-rays and gamma rays, you'll see it says you know, 10 to the negative 10th, 10 to the negative 12th, 10 to the negative 14th. What that represents is the wavelength. And if you look at this equation, it says energy is equal to uh, Planck's constant times the speed of light constant so those are two constants that remain the same and they're divided by the wavelength. So energy is inversely related to the size of the wavelength. That is to say, if you imagine this HC over uh, lambda, uh, where lambda stands for wavelength, you can imagine that's a fraction. So the bigger the denominator becomes in that fraction, the smaller energy will become. So the bigger the wavelength, the, the less energy it has. Conversely, the smaller the denominator value, or the smaller the wavelength, the more energy that particular, particular light wavelength has. That is why if you look at x-rays that are 10 to the negative 10th wide for the wavelengths and all the way down the gamma rays which are 10 to the negative 14th they're very small wavelengths they have a lot of energy and that energy allows them to be very ionizing and ionizing means that they have the ability to knock off electrons and cause atoms to become ionized or to have a charge to them which you can imagine um, could be quite harmful to the cells This is an example of a irradiated set of strawberries versus non-irradiated. And the symbol above there is a sign that uh, the foods have been irradiated. Irradiation of foods is probably most common um, with spices, where spices are irradiated, their surfaces. There's also something called non ionizing radiation and this is the use of short wavelength ultraviolet light 
So ultraviolet light, it makes up a certain range as we saw on one of these previous slides that take us back. Ultraviolet rays are just, uh, just under the visible light range. And the shorter versions of that ultraviolet light, the ones that kind of lay on the left of that continuum, are used um, for non-ionizing radiation. And what they do is they create pyrimidine dimers. Thymine dimers is what specifically they attack. So thymidine is one of the base pairs in our DNA. It's one of the letters in our code. And this causes these two thymines to where they once were uh, non-interacting with each other. It causes them to form bonds with neighboring thymines. And this distorts the DNA and interferes with the processes of uh, transcription, translation, which we'll talk about later, the process of making genes from our uh, proteins from your genes, as well as the replication of the DNA itself. So this leads to mutations in, uh, in the organism or changes in the ability of it to make proteins. One of the drawbacks of using UV light is it's, it, it is not very good at penetrating objects. So that's why uh, sun exposure and UV light can cause skin cancer, but it won't cause lung cancer. That's because it's non-ionizing and low penetrating. So you're not going to be able to use UV light to disinfect um, things that might be inside of a jar or media, things like that. It won't be very effective on. And here's a visual representation of what we discussed. So here is your double-stranded DNA, and you can see that those uh, thymines start interacting with each other, forming what is known as a thymine dimer. Um, in image B, you can see a hood that's being exposed to UV light. And uh, again, that type of UV light is called UVC, which is the extra short waves of light. So, checkpoint three, which of the following is a form of ionizing radiation? Next we have sonication. Sonication uses high frequency sound waves in order to damage cell or viral structures and this results in death or destruction of the pathogen. Um, it's also often used in dental practices, reliant sonication. Uh, probably the way it affects the, uh, the bacteria the most is a couple of methods. One, it causes the DNA to break down and two, it can cause tremendous amounts of heating inside of the cells and thereby killing them. Membrane filtration doesn't kill the microbes <clears throat> or uh, slow their growth, but it's an exclusion process in which you run a solution through a membrane filter and you collect the sterile medium on the other side. And that filter uh, excludes certain microbes from being able to pass through. Typically, it's used to remove bacteria and eukaryotes. So the filter pores, if you imagine a bacteria, is down to about one micron in, in diameter or one micrometer in diameter. And eukaryotes, remember, are a lot larger up to like 300 micrometers or more. Uh, so if you pass that uh, sample through a, uh, the most common filter pore is 0 0.2 micrometers or smaller, then it prevents those microbes from being able to get through to the other side. And this is really ideal for certain mediums that might be susceptible to heating. So um, for example, 
Um, if you heat sugar up for too long, we know that it changes its its chemical nature. You know, you can make things like caramel, like uh, it, when you make uh, English toffee, you can make toffee out of those sugars. So sometimes things like sugar solutions, uh, you don't want to heat them up, but rather you want to filter sterilize them. Here's an example of what that uh, poor system might look like. Um, so you have these uh, bacterium that can't quite get through those small pores. Um, they can a little bit here. So this might not be the best pore size for whatever is getting through this, this pore, but uh, um, it's, it's, it's not bad. Um, probably uh, this bacterium, you might get a little bit through, but I'm not quite sure if this is the um, the proper size to be using here. Okay, checkpoint four. Which of the following groups would be least reliably filtered with a 0 0.2 micrometer filter? Viruses, eukaryotes, small amoebas, fungi, or bacteria? Okay, similar to the filters we saw previously, air filtration is also very important. Um, we use high efficiency particulate air filters or HEPA filters, which are, are also available for residential or commercial use. Um, and the following slide kind of shows how this works. And so you have a frame and you have a continuous sheet of filter medium. And this filter medium is a range it is arranged with randomly arranged fibers and so it has an interception and then an impaction and then a uh, diffusion and that just shows you the way different size molecules can travel through this so you can see clearly uh, anything that's bigger over one micron is going to be easily captured in this frame and then to varying degrees, uh, things that are less than uh, 0.1 micrometer can either be intercepted by hitting these fibers or uh, eventually diffused through. Next, we're going to be talking about a variety of uh, chemical antimicrobials. Um, phenols, uh, which are less common in consumer products now, such as triclosan, which is used in, as a hospital-grade disinfectant um, that it, and is typically reserved for hospital environments, can be used for uh, killing microbes. And here's an image of what that looks like. There are heavy metals that are used as well. Copper sulfate is often used in fountains to control algae and zinc oxide can be used in diaper rash ointments. Halogens, um, such as betadine, which we see here, is a common skin antiseptic. Then uh, what we're probably most familiar with are alcohols. So they're often used um, such as rubbing alcohols to treat a wound, isopropyl alcohol, or ethyl alcohol for hand sanitizer. Um, these are generally the best to be used at 70% concentration. Alcohols function by disrupting uh, lipids and denaturing or degrading proteins, breaking up proteins. Um, be aware though that this is a time dependent process and in order to kill close to 100% of microbes, um, the laboratory tests show that it needs to be 70% ethanol for five minutes on a clean surface. So if you used you know, just a very small dab on your hands, which are organic matter, and they, you can't ever perfectly clean them, you can imagine that that's not, not going to completely sterilize or completely knock down all of the microbes. So you want to make sure that when you're cleaning with alcohols that you get the area well wetted um, so that it remain wet for a, a, at least a, you know, a short period of time.
Surfactants are also really commonly used in the household. So these are uh, hydrophil. That these are chemical compounds that have a hydrophilic head. That means this head uh, loves to interact with water molecules, and that's as you can see in this image. Um, that's because it has a, a negative charge to it, and uh, water molecules tend to act, interact really well with things that are cations or anions. And the entire rest of that molecule is called a hydrophobic tail. And you notice that there's no charge in any of these uh, atoms here. So when you see hydrocarbons without oxygens, typically they're hydrophobic. That means that they are, it literally means fearing water. And hydrophobic compounds are things like oil molecules, lipids, fats, things like that. And so these surfactants, an example being soap, they have the ability to attach themselves to a variety of different dirt and grease and, and grime and other um, molecules um, and, and strip them away and wash them away uh, underwater. And they also have an effect on uh, damaging the, uh, the lipid membranes of bacteria um, because it interacts with those lipids and can interfere with the uh, integrity of them. Um, similar to that, we have quats. Quats are detergents. Um, here they're shown in blue. And quats interact in sort of the same function. So they have that hydrophobic tail and it actually collates itself into the, into the membrane. And by doing so, they disrupt that uh, bilipid membrane. Bisguanidines like hiblicans, which is used in our lab for hand washing, also disrupts membranes and is static and cytal against a wide variety of microbes. Next are the alkylating agents. So the alkylating agents are molecules that essentially alkylate um, proteins. So they react with mac uh, macromolecules in the, in the cell. And the way they react is they actually just combine with them. And by combining with them, uh, they change their uh, form or function. So two examples of these are formaldehyde and glutaraldehyde. And in this image I have here, you can see here's this formaldehyde molecule and it sticks to that protein. These are very strong chemical antimicrobials and they can also kill uh, endospores. And um, you don't really generally find these in your typical uh, local store. Next are peroxygens. You probably remember we talked about hydrogen peroxide and how it's highly reactive. And so um, these molecules are often used as antimicrobials. Here you have a hydrogen peroxide topical solution. And yes. Okay, now we also can have antimicrobials in our food. So we can have chemical preservatives such as benzoic and propionic acids. And um, a lot of these are thought to sort of inhibit microbial enzymes. We can test microbes' ability to, um, or their, their resistance to certain my antimicrobials, and this is done through something called a disc diffusion test. Um, we won't, uh, we, we will be working this on a later lab. I don't know if it's lab 11 for our current syllabus. But what you do is you soak a, a small little pad in that, uh, that antimicrobial at a certain concentration. And you take a plate that you've spread bacteria on and you put those little discs on that plate. And you can see here, these little discs are present. And then you let that plate grow overnight. And then you follow up the next day and you see uh, how the microbes grew. So this plate, originally it was clear and then the microbes grew up and gave this cloudy uh, appearance to it. So if you see a zone of, uh, of clearance, 
Um, that indicates that the uh, bacteria were incapable of growing due to the diffusion of that antimicrobial into the medium. So in this first plate, you can see that three of these antimicrobials were ineffective against this bacteria, but this fourth one was. Um, the diameter of this uh, zone of inhibition is measured and it's used to calculate how resistant or susceptible this particular microbe is to this particular antimicrobial. So the larger zone of inhibition around the disc means the more susceptible that bacterium is to the chemical and a lack of a zone in indicates complete resistance to that chemical. And remember, just because a bacteria is resistant to that antimicrobial, it doesn't mean that the patient is. And here's our final checkpoint five. Um, from this lecture, I want you to go back and name one chemical antimicrobial and what group, type, or category it fell under as an antimicrobial. And that wraps up uh, our discussion of chapter 13. Thank you so much for joining me and we'll see you next time.